new choices, new players, new models of care. You know consumer first healthcare is everywhere. For us to build the future, to see what's new, we gotta look at the world from a different point of view. Consumer innovation ain't going away. I say it's here to stay, today it leads the way. We gotta drop the silos, we're all the same team. Experience, business, tech, and marketing. So join us now, join the revolution. Consumer first health is the evolution. Status quo, or like status, no. Yeah, this is the healthcare rep. Yo, come on, let's go. Welcome back to the leading podcast about consumer innovation. I'm Jared Johnson, and here's what's going to go down today. We have the flavor of the week about University of Rochester Medical Center's innovative way to bring healthcare to bank branches. How is URMC using unconventional partnerships to improve access in rural communities? And what other solutions can we discover as we follow their lead with more collective problem solving? I'll talk about that. Then Paul Schrimpf joins me for the first in a special mini series about the future of marketing. For our first episode in the series, we welcome Kyle Smith, head of marketing for healthcare at Noom. As you can imagine this train is full speed from the start. So let's get moving. It's time to dive right in. Are you ready? Let's go. Flavor of the week. It's time for your checkup. Let's head to the bank. Virtual care in rural communities is now happening at select bank branches in upstate New York thanks to an initiative by the University of Rochester Medical Center. URMC announced a first-of-its-kind initiative to improve access and wellness outcomes through the distribution of telehealth stations located at local bank branches. The live video visits connect patrons with a UR medicine provider to help address non-urgent health concerns. According to the Rochester Business Journal, the initiative is the first time a health system and a financial institution have partnered to provide telehealth-equipped health stations to rural communities. This will serve three rural communities, all with limited healthcare providers and where many residents lack broadband home internet. The initiative includes multiple partners, including Five Star Bank, Higgy, DexCare, and Verizon Business. Higgy's telehealth-enabled smart health stations are installed in private enclosed spaces in three Five Star Bank branches and measure key health indicators, including risk for high blood pressure, obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart attack, and stroke. The health stations allow users to connect with UR medicine providers through virtual appointments facilitated by DexCare's virtual on-demand platform and connected to the internet by Verizon's fixed wireless access. There are so many reasons to like this, from how it addresses communities with limited resources to how it brings care to the people. But my favorite reason is the collective problem solving, which DexCare highlighted on their LinkedIn. Here's their POV. They said the URMC initiative underscores how we can think differently about where, when, and how healthcare is accessed. Community banks are not just financial neighbors who reinvest in their community, but convenient hubs to speak with a virtual doctor or to receive a referral. After all, it's the collective problem solving and resilience that creates community, and this initiative is no different, close quote. The fact that an academic medical center can use extra space in local banks to expand care is truly out of the box. Simply put, it's consumer innovation at its finest. Now it's up to consumers to take advantage of this awesome new resource and be willing to try something new, but either way, we need more of this. A lot more. Let's follow URMC's lead and see what other solutions we can discover with more collective problem solving and out of the box thinking. That's another way that we'll build the healthcare of tomorrow. And that's the flavor of the week. All right, let's get into the flow, everyone. As I mentioned earlier, Paul Shrimp is joining me to co-host this mini-series on the future of healthcare marketing. Paul hosts the Microdosing Podcast. You should check that out. He's a colleague and friend. Hey, Paul, what have you been up to lately? Oh, hey, Jared. Thanks uh, for having me. Always a pleasure. All sorts of things these days. It's it's not so much what I'm up to. It's how do I succinctly describe what I'm up to. But I'm excited to kind of get this series going around marketing and consumerism because so much has changed in that space from you know the age-old MarTech dialogue to the over overused AI dialogue, but they kind of jump in and start talking real tangible things around how people are managing their teams or collaborators, et cetera, is kind of where I'm uh, I'm spending a lot of my time and excited to kind of keep the conversation going here today. Likewise. And to that point, when we're talking about the future of healthcare, what's coming, I couldn't be more excited to kick it off with the, with our guest today. Uh, we have Kyle Smith. Please give it up for Kyle. He's the head of marketing for healthcare at Noom. Kyle, welcome to the Healthcare Wrap. Hey, thanks for having me. Can you give us the, like, the two-minute description of who you are and what you do? We'll dig into some of the cool things that are happening, but tell us about you first. Yeah, I had a marketing and healthcare at Noom, which was actually a brand new capability the day that I joined. Uh, that was kind of Noom's mission was to create a whole commercial business model 
based off a very successful consumer business, which obviously for the long term isn't always going to be forever sustainable. So thinking about what's the next the next thing for Noom. And in that two years have, you know, kind of built something from the ground up, which was interesting um, at Noom, the, the indicator of starting this whole thing was actually users that were seeing huge success that happened to be benefit managers <laughs> and would call us as an inbound and say, hey, do you sell this to businesses? And um, so that early indicator of interest is kind of like the, the flag for it. So when I came in, it was about setting up a commercial business strategy, figuring out what our value proposition was, standing up the brand, which was Noom for Work, and then taking that over into also the member engagement side. So my team is responsible for the first sale, which is the B2B side, as well as the second sale, which is the member enrollment and the engagement. Well, that rolls on into what, what I was going to ask next is if you could give us a layperson's description of, of Noom, like the, you know, the, the overall landscape there, what's different, what's, what's moving and shaking? Yeah, so overall, at the end of the day, Noom is an app. I'm a single app platform that I would say at the end of the day is, is a psychology-based solution that really focuses on habits and behavior change. We just happen to do weight and stress and anxiety management. But at the end of the day, our job is to help people get out of their own way, kind of figure out what is the why and what is the barrier preventing them from doing what they do. In this case, you know, losing weight or stressing less and we help them get there. So we use a lot of psychology, we use a lot of CBT to kind of create that experience. We have two business units. One is our consumer business, which is focused on subscription-based programs. I'm sure somebody on the on this podcast or those listening have seen at least one Facebook ad or one Instagram ad from Noom. We spend a lot of money trying to get people to click on that ad and, and enroll. And we have an entire product team built on engagement. And I think that's kind of what sets us apart from the rest is our ability to attract and engage people over a long period of time using things that they can actually relate to. On the business side, we look at trying to grow Noom as an employee benefit or as a benefit that can be used by payers to sell to their plan sponsors. And now we're actually expanding that into PDMs that can use it as a, um, a point solution and this year, we're going to be expanding even deeper into health systems, especially as the prevalence of GLP-1s and medications have come out. You know, what's the lifestyle program that people should be using to go along with that prescription? And Noom is pretty well positioned for that. That's great. That's great. And I'd love to, to kind of take a few of those nuggets that, you, that you've mentioned, but from establishing the marketing team, understanding where Noom's expanding... This isn't your first marketing rodeo. You've managed marketing teams before in different sectors, but would love for you to kind of zoom out and just think through like, if you think about the marketing teams and the structure that you needed 10 years ago and what you're finding yourself having to build at Noom, what's changed? What's changing? What should we be thinking about staying in front of? But would love your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, the first one was like, bigger is not always better. I think in most old marketing teams, it was giant organizations. You kind of prove your value by how many people you have on your team doing different things. And they're all specialists in certain fields. And especially at Noom, it's kind of hilarious because we're a 15-year-old company, but we still call ourselves a startup. I don't know why, but I think it gives us, it gives us license to uh, still act nimbly and not invest in things that we should be investing in. But when I began, it was me. I was the, the first marketing hire for this commercial business. And my two most important hires to make were a product marketer to really understand what is the value proposition that we're going to create and how do we expand that out to these different buyer types. And the second was a demand gen marketer, figuring out how do we really attract and engage the types of audiences that we're looking to get uh, through the product that we had to sell. And that was really the first almost year and a half was it was a three-person team. I had an external agency that was an extension of the creative that we were using. But ultimately, we had a strong strategy built around our product model. And we had a good demand gen strategy that we could actually draft off of this consumer business. Um, we had a pretty good formula for success. And that's actually rang true. You know, Now we're in second year. We have 240 employer clients, like two and a half million covered lives. We have three health plans signed up, a couple of health systems, two PBMs. So it's um, it's been a good good result so far. That's great. I like how you said a lot of senior marketers pride themselves on their teams, their budget. And I continue to see that. Like They correlate value to what their budget is every year, and they tend to showcase the amount of activity they've accomplished every year. But I think there's a 
unfortunately a growing proportion of marketing leaders that are bragging about activity and not impact. And I liked how you've begun poking at a few things that you already said in terms of, are we be successful in changing the behaviors we need to change that are better for the members, but also for the business, but would love for you to keep talking a little bit of like the dialogue you tend to have with your senior leadership peers, whether that be the CFO or COO in terms of your role and kind of what success looks like in their eyes? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm actually always kind of a bit of a conservative marketer. I came from, you know, my background was, you know, coming from Bronner Salzburg Humphrey that's, you know, eventually became Digitas and having a very strategic and measured approach in marketing and having impactful marketing. It's not about excess, it's about impact. Marketers produce a lot of crap. And sometimes you only use it once and it goes in the can and you're like, what was the value of the thing you actually made? So um, I actually get quite nervous asking for too much because my, my fear is I'm not going to deliver on the actual dollars that I'm getting. And so when we sat down and, and looked at our initial budget for the first part of the year and said, what will it take to get out there? I think I had, you know, like $750,000 that I proposed. And it was because I didn't need more than that to honestly tell the story that we wanted to tell and invest in a couple of events that really mattered where the biggest buyer types are going to be. And we already had a consumer brand. So it's like, why invest in areas that actually don't provide value if you're already doing it anyway? So let's just draft off of it and make more of it. And then the second part was just looking at you know this classic startup mentality of what kind of value can we produce for $0? We were sitting on a treasure trove of inbounds that were consumer customers signing up for the app every day, tens of thousands of people. So just asking a simple question in the buy flow of, do you actually work at a company where you make benefits decisions? If the answer is yes, that became a pretty hot lead for us. And those leads converted really well. And uh, we've actually continued to use our con our consumer app even for our B2B clients uh, to ask, you know, hey, are you a member of... Care first, for example. And if yes, you could get this for free. Click here to find out more. And we take them right into kind of a surprise and delight experience. So use what you have first. Don't ask for net new things just for the sake of asking. Um, there's, there's more to be had with what you already have. Yeah. I, I think we're in, in an era of the high tech marketer as well as the pragmatic marketer. So those are a really great point. What are the tools in that tool set that you're using that you're like, it's helpful to you, everyone should be aware of this, people on your team, you want to make sure they know that they're either using this or they're aware of this. What are some of those those tools in that tool belt? Yeah, mine are going to sound pretty simple because again, you know, we kind of stuck with, with the G Suite and Mixpanel. You know, I have access to Mixpanel. Our entire team has access to Looker. All the data we have access to. So I think the biggest difference for us was not the quality or type of tool we were using, but the accessibility of that tool and the ability for people to manage it on their own versus punting something over the fence to marketing analytics person to say, hey, tell me what this thing looks like. We do that ourselves. We go in there and pull our own data. We measure our own performance on our website. Our website still, I'm almost embarrassed to say, is, uh, is WordPress, but it's good enough and it works. And um, we haven't seen you know, any degradation yet so far, but it is something that I'm looking to improve for, for the future. All right. That's the inside scoop right there. And I think that's the, the point too with like these sometimes bloated marketing teams is you have to hire people who just understand the platforms that you're using. And now your overhead has gone up by 50% just to say, hey, I need a high spot manager. I need a Salesforce admin. I need all these things that you take an overly complicated platform that you probably shouldn't be buying if, if it requires you know headcounts to use it. I will say we do use Salesforce. Not, and that wasn't my first choice, by the way, but, uh, but that's what we have. So we work around it. But yeah, I remember old roles. I was at a place where we used Highspot. And um, I mean, we had like three people. Their full-time job was just to nag you every day about like updating the tags that you made in Highspot. I'm like, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> well, that, that's the other fascinating <laughs> piece is people keep on talking about like AI and marketing. And I think there's a bias for people to try to figure out what AI is, like the, the programming. But I think that it's, it's worth talking to your vendors and, and software providers of how they're embedding it. Because where a lot of these players were five years ago were different. Like what you can do with WordPress is bigger and better. You know, there's probably a point where things kind of shift around, but how Salesforce is weaving in their AI to solution, because all of these tech players aren't standing still and they're all making things more usable, more scalable. And it's important to kind of stay close and just have two-way dialogues with some of them going, what's what's rolling out? Are you the right solution for the future? Because I'm uh, in my personal situation, I'm now shocked. I haven't seen WordPress in a while. I haven't seen HubSpot in a while. And I'm shocked at what they're able to do these days. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not 
not sure where to draw that opinion, but I just go, hey, keep an eye on everybody. They're not staying still and use them the best way you can. Yeah. I mean, I put myself in the center. You know, every time I get pitched a new platform, I look at myself as the primary consumer of this thing and I'm like, do I have the time for this? You know, do I actually have the time to invest in all the learning that's going to go behind that? And if it's not intuitive, frankly, I'm just not that interested because I'm just too lazy. I have a feeling that's not just you thinking that, Kyle. <laughs> <I think> that's <laughs> quite common. You know, to state the obvious here. Building on what you're saying, like, what do I need my team to be worrying about, thinking about? But as technology is changing and I have a bias that while most of my marketing friends, and I'm making a lot of enemies when I say this, think they don't have enough budget and they need more. I'm kind of with you, Kyle, is I actually think they could be doing more with less if they knew how. But when you translate in that into a talent management perspective on who you need in your team and contrast that with who you had to have or needed on your team 10 years ago, what are those skills and traits that you're looking for? And how are you kind of, you already mentioned kind of how you're designing some of the team, but would love to hear more about that uh, from you. Yeah, well, I I kind of, you you know, looking at this, and we did take a very much a startup mentality starting this. and, And the new philosophy has always been, you know, hey, experiment, show us value. If value is there, we'll invest in it. And um, it's a good thing to stand by. So when we treated take this kind of startup model, it wasn't about hiring a bunch of senior people. I need the strategic doers. So it's really that kind of more middle manager tier that really understands how to be strategic, but also how to deliver on those things. So as we're all kind of pulling together, it was, can I actually think of a good value story? Can I pull that together into the pillars that it needs to land into? How does that interact and engage with our brand? How does that actually transcend into the buyer types that are considering us and how do we buy them? All those things for me is what product marketing is and has how it should be built. And that was the number one hire I had to make first was finding a really good product marketer. The demand gen marketer was almost like, how do I get a blend of marketing operations and MarTech and a little bit of paid media all wrapped up into one human being. And I actually found someone who was great and is able to manage all things, including even doing a little bit of Salesforce admin as well, so that we could actually have a machine that was up and running, lead capture, lead generation, the throughput, the tagging, the valuation of that. And now that we've seen growth happen in this first year, uh, we've expanded the team to now think about content marketing. I mean, it really is the currency to have conversations with anybody that you want to engage with in B2B. And we are at this point now where we have so many various degrees of buyer types and segments we're trying to engage with. It's taking that singular story, but then figuring out what's the best way to make that story work based on the lens that people are looking at it through and create that narrative that can really kind of draw people in from the top of the funnel all the way to the bottom. So we've invested heavily there. We're now investing more in member marketing and then also a lot more on the paid media side because um, I really want to try to amplify our consumer channels as a means to reach our B2B decision makers. That's great because I'd, I'd love to underscore a, a couple things that you mentioned. One, just always trying new things and proving the value. There's that, there's that mindset. There's the tactics. You can translate it into things that you're doing on, but also kind of the software you might be doing it because I've learned... You need a mindset. You can't be just doing, okay, this is what worked before. Let's just do what worked before. But you should be tinkering with things. And at least maybe I'm not as lucky, but I I have a hunch I'm pretty similar to everybody else, is every quarter I'll try 10 new things. Seven of them won't work, but at least I'll figure out the two and two and a half that do. Carry that forward, add another 10, where my like success rate is arguably terrible. But when you add it up over time, it, it creates a new kind of base to work from and even translates into like software. Like I love tinkering with marketing software. And if it's not easy, to use, I'll give it a chance. And I, I used a, a content AI platform a couple of weeks ago. It's like, okay, drop a YouTube video in, it'll create social media content. In about 10 minutes, I realized, though, you're creating a transcript and you're trapping it, dropping it in chat GPT. This is not worth me paying for it. Like, this is kind of a scammy kind of platform. Mm-hmm. But unless you kind of let yourself tinker with things or tinker with different styles of content, hope based content, fear based content, stat based content, personal stories, you're never going to learn. But, but you also get a lot of great stats that you can kind of build from and be very quantitative and business-like in making your arguments as well. So I just kind of want to essentially restate what you said because I, I really agree with a lot of your points there. Yeah, and I think it's also like actually it's a challenge I'm kind of giving to my own team is we should be living our own brand. I mean, Noom has done, it's built what it's been today as a product by doing thousands of experiments with real world situations, with real people to determine from a behavior economic standpoint was me doing that, getting you to change your habit this way or that way. Oh, it didn't work? Great. I'll learn from that and I'll try it again this way. 
And we should be doing the exact same thing on the marketing side. We should be no different than product when it comes to optimizing the benefits that we're trying to get. I'm going to give that a 100. <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree there. Uh, so then one other element or factor to add in here is what are the, the needs and expectations of consumers? And it's always been interesting. There's this evolution, I feel like, of when we've been talking about addressing consumerism, which was kind of a dated concept at this point. Now the fact of that was just, oh, consumers have choices. And great. That was a new concept to you know some elements of healthcare, but now we're talking about the evolution of that concept, which is it's their expectation about how easy it was to engage with whatever this product or service is that is driving innovation, and those are the areas that become competitive advantages. So, how does that when you break all that down, and we can just use a term like consumer innovation, we can use whatever term we want for it. But how does that fit among all the other priorities you were just describing, and and how can marketers be approaching that in a way that actually works right now? Yeah, I mean, for for me, it's always in my top three. Like in healthcare, if you're not attracting engaging members for the thing that you intended to be sold in the first place, you're not going to get renewed, and you're probably going to be out of business really, really fast. I think that the best thing we ever did at Noom was actually start consumer first, which by the way, wasn't our choice. We actually started this business with the intent to sell to healthcare. And when you sit down with your first payer as a startup who knows nothing about the healthcare business, you quickly realize (laughs) you're not going to succeed in healthcare. So actually through the failure of not signing on new business commercially, we started a consumer business. And if you're going to create a subscription-based model, you have to make that product amazingly perfect because you're pulling at your credit card and paying for this out of pocket and Noom is not cheap. So the, the amazing thing for me was that coming in, it was the thing that I was most excited about with Noom is the fact that we weren't doing what every other healthcare B2B business was doing, which was my capital C consumer is the payer and my lower C consumer is the actual user. Here, we're coming in with a perfect user product that's already made to work and simply just showing the payer why that actually works for them and how to make it actually work better for them. And then the brand investment's always been a top priority for me. I think that um, we don't spend enough time on brand, especially in B2B. And we had the luxury of having that in new with a lot of the consumer spend that we're doing. But when you think about what payers think about, which is if I buy this, will they use it? We average a 25% adoption rate for Noom at, at employers, meaning one out of four employees when they're offered Noom, download it. So when you create this value prop that most people try to say in healthcare, which is happier, healthier employees with lower costs, it's like, great. How many people use your thing that you actually offer to that business? Maybe one or two percent. So like we're doing it to set scale and actually creating real value. So if you're not investing in that, you're completely thinking about, thinking about this wrong. I, I do like that because that's been a personal pet annoyance of mine in healthcare, which is so many of my executive friends in healthcare talk about. It's about education and empowerment. And at Noom, it's different. It's about making behavior change easy, which I think is so critical for true consumerism. Because I people that listen to me hear me say this phrase all the time. You can give me all the tools you want and all the kit education that you want, and you can make changing my oil easy. I'm still going to take it to the service station. It's easier for me to go someplace than to do something myself. So it's always this, how do we get behavior change? Or I'll translate to like diabetes patients. Most of the people I know who have diabetes know they should be eating better, know they should be losing weight, know they should be exercising more. They're just not doing it. But would love to keep have see you kind of keep riffing on how Noom owns this behavior chain space, both from just a product and a category and consumerism space. It's kind of funny how for every, and, and it's funny coming, you know, before Noom, I was at CVS Health and really sitting on, on a payer side, thinking about not only Aetna, but also a care market PBM and also a retail store and like taking the best of all three of those things to create these payer agnostic products. And a lot of those things, you know, didn't always work because you're always building it with your own internal eye uh, versus the external eye. And what I'm finding now is that we're doing a lot of re-education for a lot of our buyers, which is like, hey, so the KPIs that I want to use for your product are going to be number of logins per month and time spent on the app and X, Y, and Z. And that's how you're going to get paid. And I said, well, why don't we just pay for outcomes? Because you know what? We actually designed Noom to come to it the least amount that you need to, but at least you want to. And so this desirability in terms of making these little bite-sized activities 
and content components and videos that people watch. I mean, you spend less than 10 minutes a day in the product itself. But the benefit is that 42% of our engaged users lose at least 5% of their body weight. And it's that insatiable desire to like do something because you want to do it because it's fun and it actually speaks your language and your way of thinking and it adapts to you because it kind of learns your mannerisms and kind of uses a little bit of AI in there. But then the best part is that it lasts. So when you think about after using Noom, does it actually work? Uh, we just did this, this huge study because now obesity is becoming so big in the US. People that had 30 plus BMI scores who had lost 10% of their body weight, which is like 25 to 40 pounds. 49% of those people kept all the weight off two years after finishing Noom. So if you can embed using behavior economics, new ways to think about doing something you normally wouldn't have done, which is probably the hardest thing to ever do is to change a, change a habit for the better, that we can be successful doing that. And frankly, 90% of that was marketing, using marketing and behavior economics to create new new ways to think about new things to, to change your behaviors for the better. Paul, I think what I got out of that was the question of what are you making easier? We do hear traditional provider organizations and health systems who are saying better care made easier, for instance, you know, as their, their mission. And you're like, which part? And is it the parts that people care about? And maybe we could be asking that question a little bit more and, and get to a different place. I, I just love that thought. Well, it's kind of sad too, from a marketing standpoint as a B2B marketer, you know, you go to these conferences and events. And um, we, we went to a, a, quite a few this year. And I always like to walk down the hallway and just kind of see what the little taglines are. And it's usually has something to do with happier and healthier. And usually it's also lowering costs at better value. So you could literally just put your thumb over the name of the company <laughs> and you wouldn't really know who it is. And it wouldn't matter what, what name you put in there because they're all saying the exact same thing. The, the thing I'm never brave enough to say, it was the, the moment in Patch Adams when Robin Williams was in character and he was speaking to a psychiatrist. Like, I figured out I want to help people with what they're trying to do. And, and the doctor's like, yeah, but that's what I do. And then Robin Williams' character turns around and goes, yes, but you suck at it. <laughs> everybody's saying the same thing everybody's wanting to do the same thing but we all kind of suck at it <laughs> yeah yeah I, I heard a, an old saying from an old colleague you know that was one point for saying it two points for doing it and um i think that really is a thing even 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 our competitors all say we do this that and the other with behavior change i'm like show me one slice of evidence that you actually have changed someone's behavior for the better without a point or an incentive, or a carrot, or a stick that's gotten them to do something in the short term and to actually have any impact in the long term. And it's the long term that really makes the difference. Amazing. Uh, Kyle, what else should marketers be keeping their eye on and paying attention to right now? You know, for me, it's, it's always you know, data privacy and compliance has been, you know, a niggler for us, especially as you look at things like, you know, with iOS, when I first joined Noom, we had to reconsider our entire strategy in terms of engaging consumers and on the B2B side, making sure that what you're designing is going to be within compliance. I think so many marketers don't put an eye towards that in their strategy. And then they come by a little bit deflated saying, oh, we can't even legal, let us do this. So having a better strategy for that. And then for me, it's trying to really do a lot more scalable video production. I would love to really do a lot more video with our content this year. And we're lucky that our, um, our office in Hudson Yard actually has a built-in studio. And so we just build things at the speed of need, cut it, post it, get it out the door. I and mean, so I want to do that at a much harder clip this year than we did last year and hopefully have stuff, you know, on a daily basis almost versus weekly. That's a plus one on the video. That's my, I always like really tactical recommendations, but I believe if everybody starts with high quality video, you have enough technology where you can cut it up, splice it up and repurpose it in almost any format. But as long as you've kind of got that good video foundation, you can really create a lot of efficiencies on the rest of the content strategy you have. Agreed. Uh, this has been a lot of fun, Kyle. Uh, any final thoughts, anything we haven't mentioned yet that you want to make sure our, our listeners would could hear from you? Yeah, I think on the B2B side, like we talked about for me, think big, but start small. You know, you don't need an army to be effective. Stay nimble, stay fast. Better to do that than to do something big and, and overly thought out. And, you know, for me, the biggest change I've in, in, imposed this year is if you can... And so that doesn't work for everybody, but but bring your creative in-house. We work in a really complex, difficult to understand business. 
And if you don't have creatives that really understand how your businesses make decisions, it's an uphill battle working with external groups to, to get that same kind of level of understanding. So this year, my entire creative team is in-house, copywriters, designers, producers, and they all know our business intimately. So the more you can do that, the faster you can work. Great place for us to wrap up here. Kyle, thanks so much for giving us a think about today. That's a wrap for this episode. I've had the pleasure of speaking with Kyle Smith from Noom and having Paul Shrimp's co-host here. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please spread the word. Tell your colleagues to tune in for all the awesomeness, then leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This show is produced by Shift Forward Health, the channel for changemakers. Subscribe to Shift Forward Health on your favorite podcast app, and you'll be subscribed to our entire library of shows. See our full lineup at shiftforwardhealth.com. One subscription, all the podcasts you need, and it's all for free. And remember, we might have a lot of work to do in healthcare, but we'll get there faster together. Thanks again.